Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Good morning, Karis family. Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Erin Weisbro, and we are so excited that you're joining in with us today. We have some exciting things in store for you, but first we have some announcements. So we just want to remind you that we want you to interact with us by asking questions. Please post your questions in the comments section below and stay tuned because we will get to your question at the end of the teaching today and we will get to as many questions as we can. Remember that this is Karis Daily Live Bible Study. So you can join us live during the weekdays and those times are Mondays and Fridays at 10 a.m., Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. and Wednesday mornings at 7 a.m. If this ministry has been a blessing to you like it has been to so many other people, we would like to encourage you to donate or become a partner with this ministry. You can do that by visiting our website at awmi.net slash give, or you can call our helpline at 719-635-1111. And we want to thank all of our partners who are currently partnering with, the, with this ministry. We really, really appreciate you. Thank you. We could not do things like this without you. And also, when you call our helpline, remember that we have prayer ministers standing by 24-7. They love to pray with you. We love to be in agreement with you for anything that you're going through right now. Again, that helpline number is 719-635-1111. We would love to hear from you. And we have an exciting uh, teaching for you today. I am very excited to introduce you to Daniel Bennett. He is our Executive Director of Academics with Karis Bible College. And I know he's got some exciting things in store for you today. So Daniel, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you all today. And uh, uh, yeah, we, we say this every Wednesday morning, but it's bright and early. And I say it because I've got little ones. I've got a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a nine-month-old, and, uh, and they don't sleep through the night perfectly these days, and so for me, 7 a.m. still feels like 4 a.m. or something, so uh, it'll be an interesting Q&A later. <laughs> anyway, but I do want to say I'll probably have extra time, so feel free to ask um, about the topic I'm sharing about and uh, other topics. If I don't have the answer, I'll just tell you, but otherwise I'll give it a shot and we can probably get to a lot of questions toward the end. So my topic today is our secret weapon. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's a secret, obviously. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, I want to talk about joy, essentially. You know, a lot, of, a lot of negative things can happen in this world. You know, if you watch the news for five minutes or read the news online for five minutes, you know, you, you just see all these negative things going on, things that can be, I mean, sometimes you just have to stop reading those things. You know, you see a headline and it can stick with you all day long. But, you know, we talk a lot about overcoming and how we're more than overcomers. And sometimes we forget that that means that there's things we need to overcome. You know, we live in a fallen world. There's an enemy out there trying to, to destroy, kill, steal, and destroy. And so we're overcomers. But again, that means that there are going to be negative things in this world that we need to overcome. And so it can be all kinds of things. You know, maybe for some people it's hopelessness or fear or sickness or um, disease or injury, things like that. It can be other kinds of challenges, relationship challenges or career challenges or um, things like that. It can also be discouragement. You know, that's actually a big one um, for many Christians is that sometimes we can get dis discouraged or tempted to be discouraged because we know God's promises. And I know that may sound weird, but sometimes when you become so aware of everything that God wants for us, then when you don't see it right away, it can actually become discouraging where the enemy starts throwing darts at you. For me, discouragement for years was actually the one that would, would pop up the most in my life. And now for you, it, it's, it's ancient history now, it's, it's weird. The other day I was thinking about how, I was like, I, I don't remember the last time I've been discouraged, but for many years, that was the main one that would hit me is this kind of, you have so much excitement and enthusiasm about all of God's promises and things he's called you to, or just things in general that he's promised to every believer. And then when you don't see it or it's taking longer, it's not looking the way you thought it would look, you can start wondering like, am I doing it wrong? Did I mess everything up? And, and things like that. You know, Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. 
but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life, right? So sometimes we know the promise, and that's exciting, but hope deferred makes the heart sick. So sometimes when we have to wait longer than we thought, it, it can be discouraging. And it doesn't mean you have to get discouraged, it just means that that's something that you need to overcome. It needs something that we walk in victory from. You know, and that's the thing, again, God has so many things that He wants for us that sometimes it can look overwhelming and say, you know, that's, I, I don't know how to get that. I don't know how to get from where I'm at to where you've called me. And it might be, again, your calling, maybe you feel called to ministry or called to a certain career or called to be married and you're just looking around and you're like, there's no, no prospects on the horizon, things like that. And so sometimes you have a, de a desire that's so incredibly strong that what was intended to bless you ha has been turned around and started hurting you. Now that's not God's fault. It's the enemy throwing lies at us, telling us you're never going to get there, or you need to try harder, or you're not good enough, you messed it up, things like that. So, you know, whatever it is, sometimes what happens is we try to overcome in our own strength. Um, so again, whether it's discouragement or challenges or hopelessness or fear, when we try to, to meet that problem head on with our own strength, that's, that's a huge problem. And so we end up asking questions like, I know God wants this for me. I see it in the word. You hear a message about it. God wants this for you. God wants this for you. And you're like, I'm convinced. I believe you. I believe the word. But why am I not seeing it? And so we can get tempted if, again, we're looking at our own strength and we're looking at the promises and we're looking at the gap in between. Here's where I'm at. Here's where God wants me. What's going on? Um, if, if we're looking at our own strength, it can be overwhelming or, or deflating. You know, it's kind of, and again, Actually, it reminds me of a quote that I'll throw in there real quick. This is actually from Mike Murdoch. Um, he says, uh, when fatigue walks in, faith walks out. You know, and that's a very practical tip. But essentially, sometimes you can be, you know, middle of the day when you're surrounded by friends or, you know, you're, you're feeling great. You can be like, man, the world's my oyster. Look at all the promises of God. And then you stay up until 1 a.m. and you're like, what's the point? This is all pointless. And you get discouraged. You start binge watching something that you shouldn't be watching. And, and next thing you know, you just kind of give in to that. And so, um, again, sometimes we, we need practical wisdom of like, if I'm encouraged this many hours of the day, then, then I need to find a way to take that into my evenings or my early mornings or whatever it is. So one of the keys, and this is one of the main scriptures I'll, I'll be uh, leaning into today, is Colossians 2, verse 6. Colossians 2, verse 6 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you received him, so walk in him. Right? How did you receive Jesus? It was a free gift, right? Salvation is just a free gift. We didn't do anything. We didn't earn it. We didn't try to earn it. Didn't take a lot of effort, right? I mean, if you think about it, that's the biggest chasm you can ever have, right? Is I'm in death and I need to be in life. And so it's the, the most impossible thing in the natural for you to experience is getting born again. And he's saying the same way you did that is the same way you are supposed to walk your daily life. So how did you do that? Just a free gift. It's by faith. It wasn't my strength. I didn't look at myself. I didn't ask God, am I qualified to get born again? Am I good enough? Did I jump through all these hoops? Um, you know, if the enemy lies to you and says, no, you have to work harder, work harder, you're like, no, that's, it's a free gift. And so that's the same way you're supposed to walk in victory. Just receiving, this is a free gift. I'm not looking to my own strength. I just receive it by faith. This is who you said I am. This is what you said I have. This is what you said I can do. I'm just going to receive that. And having that internal assurance inside of us. So what happens, and I'll use an illustration of an airplane right now. I've shared this with the students at school before, and I have some really awesome uh, drawings that I do for this. <laughs> um, here, I'll just have to paint a picture with my words. And so sometimes what happens is we start off with God. He makes a promise to us, and we start off with him. So imagine it's like you're in an airplane with God, and he's, you're in the cockpit, and he's pointing, and he's saying, that's where I want to take you. And you say, there, like over there? And he's like, yeah, that's, that's where we're going. And you say, awesome. And then you jump out of the airplane, and you start walking. And you're like, man, this is so difficult. Like, God made it sound so fun. He said we'd be there in three hours. This is taking forever. And what happens is sometimes we, we start off with God, and he gives us a vision, and he gives us a dream. But then we walk away, and we say, okay, thank you, Lord, for telling me where I should go. I will now get there in my own strength. And so then we kind of lean on ourselves, and we say, okay, how do I get myself to where you told me to go? So, again, usually the vision part's really fun because that's where we're in faith, and God's just pointing stuff out and saying, I want you to have that, and I want you to have that, and I want you to have this other thing. And then, again, we, we can sometimes give into that temptation and say, okay, Lord, I'll do it. I don't, it's going to take a lot of work, but I'll do it. And it's completely missing the point of what God's trying to do in our lives, right? See, 
the dilemma that creates is God saying, this is what I want. And you're, you're saying, this is what God put in my heart, but it's exhausting. I feel like I'm climbing over mountains. Why is this so difficult? And God's saying, I, I, my desire was to fly over the mountains with you. It was going to be really easy. But yes, if you jump out of my grace, if you start, start trying to do this in your own strength, then yes, all those things we were going to fly over, and now you have to walk over. And some of them you get to a point where your strength isn't enough, so you won't actually get to where God's calling you if you try to do it on your own. So that can lead to doubt. Sometimes we doubt God when in reality it's that we left God behind. Where God's saying, I want you to go here, and you're saying, but why is this so hard? Like, did you really promise me that? Do you really want that for me? Maybe I need to change my doctrine, all these things. And God's just saying, get back in the airplane. Just, it, trust me, it's going to be really easy if you do it my way instead of trying to do it your way. And God's, God's telling you, here's where I want to take you. I'm not telling you this so you get there on your own. I'm telling you this so that when you see mountains, when you see storms coming, you can celebrate with me about where we're going. And I said this example many times, but I love how King David, when King David was told he was anointed king when he was a, he was a teenager, he was anointed to be king, and then what did he do? He went straight back out to the sheep. Right? And so just because God tells you where you're going, that doesn't mean you're supposed to suddenly try to stress out and get there in your own strength. Just be faithful with where you're at, follow God one day at a time, and that what He told you is where He's going to take you, not where He's demanding that you somehow figure it out. Because I don't know about you, but for me, most of the things that God's told me are things that are literally impossible for me to do on my own. And you look at it and you say, there's no way, like, I can't even work hard enough to get where you've told me we're going. It's just impossible. And, and God's saying, that's exactly the point. Don't stress out. Don't worry about it. Just, and just be faithful. You know, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. He will lift you up into whatever He's called you to do, whatever He's called you to, um, to where He's called you to be, and accomplish the things He's called you to accomplish in this lifetime. And so if, as you humble yourself and say, God, I'm going to trust you, and He's like, thank you. That's what I was asking for. I showed you that vision so you'd lean on me, and then when you lean on me, I can actually take you there. But if you run away from me, now you're just making this way more difficult. So um, what's my point in all of this? It's that we want to live from His strength. His strength, right? We want victory to be from Him, not from ourselves. It should be His strength again. So how do we know if we're doing this in His strength? How do we know, am I, am I straining and struggling on my own, or am I doing this in grace? Am I doing this in God's strength? How can I tell the difference? And so the answer to that is Nehemiah 8, verse 10. Right, Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It says that at the end of the verse. So the joy of the Lord is your strength. Right, so here's the thing about strength, is that strength doesn't actually feel like strength. And, and I'll explain, because obviously if you've ever worked out, you know, afterwards you're like, I feel strong, that's amazing. <laughs> and no one else sees it, but you feel it. You know? <laughs> Unless you work out consistently, which I have no experience with. So um, when we think of strength usually, right, if you say, imagine somebody really strong, Doing some, doing some amazing feat of strength. Usually what we think of, some people might think bodybuilders or maybe like power lifters or world's strongest man contest, things like that. But usually you picture somebody carrying a huge boulder or a huge stack of weights and they're straining and grunting and veins are popping out of their neck and they're like, ah, you know, um, you know, the Incredible Hulk or something, right? Where that's, you say, picture somebody strong and you picture somebody who's just doing something that they can barely manage. And so that's not actually the best picture of strength, because if we think that's strength and we say, yeah, when you're doing something that requires strength, then yeah, your veins should be popping out of your neck, you should be grunting and you know, breathing really hard and all these different things. And, but see, when people do that, that's not strength, that's barely enough strength. Right? There's a difference, because see, what they're doing is they're pushing their limits. They're saying, I, I can barely do this, or maybe I can't do this, I'm not sure. I'm gonna find out exactly where my strength ends. And again, and there's a place for that because people are trying to, to discover their limits and the maximums and all that, so that can still be impressive. But my point is that don't think of that when you think of strength because that's barely enough strength. If you want to picture strength, picture, you know, picking up a mug, right? See, true strength is when you are so strong compared to what you're lifting that you don't even notice that it took effort. That's what true strength is. See, again, God didn't say, I want you to have barely enough strength. Whatever you're going through, as long as you grunt and you're, you're you know, bursting, <laughs> you know, and you're sweating like crazy and all these things, God's saying, that's what I promise you. If you try hard enough, if you barely, I'll always give you just barely enough to overcome, but trust me, it'll be miserable. It'll be challenging. It'll be crazy. People around you will be like, wow, they're barely going to make it. 
and then you'll do it. That's not what God's promising us. He's promising us strength to where you don't even have to notice that, that it's heavy. Again, for, for uh, my baby, I have a nine month old. It'd be very difficult for him to carry this. He wouldn't be able to do it. He could knock it over. Um, ask me how I know. <laughs> and so he could knock it over, but he couldn't carry it, right? Because it's too heavy for him. But see, when you have more than enough strength, most adults would have no problem lifting something like this. So again, that's actually what God wants for us, is he wants to give us so much strength that the, the things we overcome don't even feel difficult. Right? I mean, if you study the story of David killing Goliath, he wasn't scared. He didn't approach that situation and say, my goodness, like, I hope I can do this. He walked in so confident. Again, so some, some many times people think David was the underdog. David knew he wasn't the underdog. He walked up and he immediately said, what's the reward for killing this guy? Like, who does he think he is? I'm going to kill him. I just want to know my reward. So again, he'd already been anointed king. The spirit of God was resting upon him already. He had superpowers, same as you can have. And so again, joy isn't just God saying, here, I'm going to give you joy so that when you barely make it, you, you feel good about it. Joy is literally the strength of the Lord. It gives us supernatural strength because joy shows that we're connected to the vine, that we're overflowing with God's strength, where we're saying, it's not my strength, it's supernatural power inside of me, right? So don't picture um, a bodybuilder or weightlifter lifting, you know, 600 pounds over their head or something when you picture strength. Picture Superman lifting a car. It's like, oh yeah, piece of cake. It's what I do. I have more than enough strength to do this. It's easy because it's not me. It's, it's something else. So again, that's the goal is we want more than enough strength, more than enough joy, not just barely enough joy. So again, when we're enjoying our relationship with God, life is easy. It doesn't mean that there's nothing to overcome, but it means that overcoming it is easy. So, I mean, again, Jesus said, my burden is light. He does the hard part. He went through things that, you know, because people may think, well, Jesus struggled, right, in the garden when he's sweating blood. But yeah, he did that so you never have to. He was, he was about to experience his father rejecting him so that the father would never have to reject us. So that's a totally different situation. Other than that, you look at Jesus' life and you never see him barely succeeding. He always had more than enough power to overcome. So if you're not overflowing with joy, and if what God's put in your heart doesn't seem easy, ask God, how do I get back in the airplane? Right? How do I reconnect? You know, and, and I'm using the airplane analogy, but really it's how do I reconnect to the vine? I've become separated because I'm trying, I'm a branch on the ground trying to bear fruit. And it's so much easier if I'm just connected to the vine because then I'm just enjoying fellowship with God and bearing fruit instead of laying there on the ground and beating myself up trying to, to force fruit to grow. So again, this is a really big deal. You know, something that God gave me conviction on a long time ago, and what I mean by that is um, I don't waver on this. It's something that, that is uh, one of the pillars of, of my understanding, is that God will never call you to do something that you can't do with joy. And this is really important because if you don't have joy, if, if you don't enjoy your job, if you don't have joy in your family, whatever it may be, you're doing it wrong because God won't call you to something that he'll never call you to do something without him. And, if he, and so if you're doing things with him, then by definition, you can have joy if you're doing things with him. Right. So, um, you know, if you're if you don't have joy in what you're doing, either God didn't call you to it or you're doing it wrong. Now, I'm not saying God didn't call you to your family. If you have a family, God did call you to your family. Um, but maybe in your career, right? You say, okay, I don't have joy right now. Is this because God's calling me to move to a new season? Or am I just doing this in my own strength? Am I forgetting to, to rely on him? And so, again, God won't call you to do anything without him. So, so don't, so many times there's excuses like, well, you don't understand. My job is really stressful. My job is too much, all these different things. Okay, either God called you to it or he didn't. And if he did, he's, he's calling to do that with you, not you to do that on your own. Again, like with Moses, right? Where he's like, you know, or he's like, go, Moses, go. And Moses is like, I'm not going if you don't go with me. If you don't go with me, I'm not going. You can have the same attitude. I mean, again, God's not the one trying to leave us. Uh, Old, Old Covenant was a bit different. There, there's more context there. But again, if God's called you to do something, say, okay, if you're calling me to do this, then I expect you to be with me. And I'm not going to leave you behind. And God's like, I, I, that's what I wanted all along. I didn't want you to do it without me. So another point on this is that your level of joy has a direct impact on how much God can use you. Because if you have, if you have, you know, three people and one has no strength, one has a little strength and one has a ton of strength, which one can do more? Right? So again, if one has no joy, one has a little joy and one has supernatural overwhelming joy, God can use them more because they have more strength. Because again, it's a reflection of walking in grace is that God's grace flowing through us. Part of that grace is his joy. 
And so if you want to walk in your calling, don't always say, well, joy. See, sometimes people think joy is just like a nice to have. It's nice to have joy, but in the end, you got to get the work done. If I don't have joy, whatever. As long as we get the mission accomplished, you know, um, we just kind of put that on the, like, if I have it, great. If I don't have it, whatever. But joy is huge. Again, imagine trying to be Superman without super strength. It'd be really difficult. You wouldn't be very effective. You're just a weirdo walking around in a cape. But if you have supernatural strength, it changes everything. I mean, Jesus even told the disciples, the apostles, don't start ministering to the world until you receive power. I don't want you to do this in your own strength. I want you to do this with my strength. So he didn't say, hey, you know, you might get a few people saved if you try witnessing in your own strength. So just keep busy, work really hard until, you know, I give you power. He said, don't do a thing. I do not want you to minister to other people. I don't want you to try to be a witness of me without my strength because you can't. To truly represent Jesus in this world, you need his power. And his joy is his power. It's not just a nice to have. It's not just an emotion surface level thing. It's the key to power. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 says, But by, gra- by the grace of God, this is Paul talking, By the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Or as Paul saying, I labored more than everybody. But it wasn't me, it was God's grace inside of me. And that's the thing, is you can accomplish so much when it's just God's grace flowing through us. And he enjoys part of that. It's I'm, I'm walking in joy. I, I, it's just supernatural. It's not because my circumstances are perfect. It's because what's inside of me is perfect. And I'm changing my circumstances because of what's inside of me. So it's flowing from the inside out, right? Again, you know this already. Joy is fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Right? You don't strain to grow fruit. You just stay connected. Right, John 15.5, I already kind of um, alluded to this one. John 15.5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And again, that's key. Yes, without Jesus you can do nothing. But with Jesus, he bears amazing fruit in you and through you without even trying. That's all you have to do. It's so simple. So again, if you have a huge vision, a huge calling, or if there's huge obstacles in your life, Don't look at your own strength and say, how am I going to overcome this? Just say, God, I'm just going to stay connected to you. You're going to fill me with your wisdom. You're going to fill me with your joy. You're going to fill me with your power. You're going to have me in the right place at the right time. So don't be overwhelmed by what situations look like. Just say, again, there's always one answer. There's even a song, right? Jesus is the answer. And so no matter what the situation looks like, the answer is the same as like, I'm going to lean into you. I'm going to rest rest in you and you'll, you'll equip me and you'll guide me in what I should be doing. So again, joy is not just something fun. It's not just like, man, that's awesome. I love having joy. I just can't stop laughing or whatever. That's not all it is. Joy really is our secret weapon, right? See, joy helps us see circumstances the way God sees them. And joy essentially is that we're tasting our victory in the spirit before we see it in the natural. We're, we're approaching situations saying, I'm, already, I'm, I'm approaching this as someone who already overcame, not as somebody who has a lot of work in front of them. And so joy is just a reflection of our spiritual reality is I'm I'm overwhelmed with joy because of what's true in the spirit. So now when I walk in the situations, I've got supernatural strength now to overcome things that to other people, they might say, how do you do it? And you're like, it it wasn't me. And like Paul said, I worked more than everybody, but it wasn't me. I mean, and Paul didn't just work. I mean, he got persecuted. He went, he did all kinds of stuff. He traveled. I mean, he was a hard worker. And he's like, but it wasn't me. It was God's grace flowing through me. So it was easy. It didn't feel like it was coming from me. It was just flowing through me. You enjoy life a lot more that way. So again, if you don't have joy, you're looking at problems. You're looking at circumstances or desires that are unfulfilled so far. You're looking at them with the wrong eyes. Because to look at them through God's eyes, you would have joy. Um, If you have joy, you're, you're kind of looking at it through the right filter and saying like, okay, I see the problem. I see what I need to overcome. And I'm excited because what's inside of me is more than enough overcome this. And so I pray that's been a blessing to some of you, or maybe just a a helpful reminder of things you probably already knew. But uh, again, don't think joy is not important. It's important in your marriage. It's important in parenting. It's important in your career and your calling and and friendships and and the news and politics and all these different things is that we can't forget our secret weapon. We can't forget that joy is not just a a fringe thing. It's not just a nice time. It's not just a decoration in your house. Joy is actually a secret to walking in victory in this world. And so I look forward to answering as many questions as we can. And uh, 
And if it's so early, no one's asking questions, then I'll just go home and go back to sleep. So <laughs> it's a win-win for me. Anyway, so thank you all. Well, thank you, Daniel. That was such a blessing. I know that I was tremendously blessed by that. And Nehemiah 810 has been such an encouragement to me in my life. The joy of the Lord is your strength because mm -hmm. to the world that can look like, oh, joy, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, but man, to the Lord is so important, you know, even just cheerful giving and mm -hmm. everything that we're doing can come from that place of strength in mm -hmm. the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. No, it's, it's been one of my favorites for a long time because to me, it's what's the point if you go through life? And, and everything's just boring or hard work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people just talk about how awful things are and you just gotta persevere, persevere, persevere. Like, I'm all for perseverance, but it doesn't have to feel like perseverance. It can feel just like, I just am enjoying life, it's easy. And so to me, I'm a big fan of, you know, you do things in God, in, in grace, and to other people, it looks like it was terrible and you're like, no, this is actually awesome. It's, it's based on things that you can't see that are inside of me that other people don't necessarily have. Amen. That is so powerful. I love that. So I have some questions for you. I'm not seeing any questions coming <laughs> through yet. So everybody must still be sleeping in today. Mm -hmm. So can you share with us if there is an area of your life where you were discouraged, Daniel, and how did you reconnect to the vine through that discouragement? Yeah. Um, yeah. And some, of, and some of these, I would say it's, um, uh, um, so one example for this is uh, marriage. So marriage is one where for a long time I didn't even want to get married. But then after a while, um, I, I felt like God was saying like, no, I, I do want you to get married and I'd go back and forth. And so it's one of those things where it's like, sometimes you're like, yeah, I'm perfectly fine. No issues whatsoever. And then other times you're kind of like, did I, did I mess this up? What, should I have, should I have married that person? I didn't think that was you, but maybe I should have. And you, um, did I, do I need to go pursue this relationship that um, I didn't have peace about, but maybe I just messed it up. Maybe I wasn't hearing God right. And so you start to second guess yourself when you have to wait a long time. And, uh, and so to me, that was one where it was just a matter of, no, God put this in my heart. He said, he's going to, he's going to make this happen. I'm just going to trust him, keep doing what he's called me to do. And, um, this will happen at the right time. And so sometimes again, it's, it's that whole hope deferred thing mm -hmm. where, where, um, sometimes we start to second guess ourselves or we start to think maybe I mess this up or maybe it won't happen. And so that wasn't so much necessarily discouragement because I, I was, I enjoyed being single, but it was more so confusion on like, I feel like you've told me this is going to happen, but I don't see it happening. And, and I'm assuming that if, if you promised it and it didn't happen, then I must've messed it up. And so again, you start to, um, second guess yourself and then you kind of go through and you're like, no, but that was God. And God told me that and God told me that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, to me, getting reconnected with that is just saying, like, it's in your hands. God, if, I'm not going to fight it, but I'm not going to stress about it. I'm just going to trust you and just keep, you know, live one day at a time. I mean, that's huge. Just what's in front of me right now. I can't live tomorrow today. I can only live today today. So what does trusting God look like today? And that will open up the doors for the tomorrows that God has in store for me. That's so good. Like, how can we be faithful where we are now? Mm -hmm. And like David, encouraging yourself in the Lord, no matter what yeah, the circumstances absolutely. say. That is so awesome. I can relate to that for sure. Mm -hmm. So I am seeing some questions <laughs> now. Thank you so much. So Lara Michelle on chat wants to know, what is the difference between happiness and joy? I'm realizing that joy isn't an emotion. That's good. Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will say, so I go kind of back and forth. It really depends on who's, who's talking, mm -hmm. um, how people define things, because it's similar to truth and facts. Some people are like, the truth is greater than the facts. And some people say the facts are greater than the truth. And it just depends on what they mean. Um, so happiness and joy, what most people, um, how most ministers define happiness is the emotion. Good things happened, you're excited about it. And then joy as more of like an internal thing that's not based on natural circumstances, it's based on who you are in the spirit. And so to me, I, again, some people use them interchangeably. A lot of times I'll use the word happiness and I'm, I'm referring to the whole thing. I'm like, I'm just happy. And they're like, well, that's, that's superficial and shallow emotion. And I'm like, well, I mean joy, but I mean everything. I'm just thrilled. I, it's a, so um, I don't get too hung up on specific definitions, but to answer your question, sorry, I give these disclaimers. <laughs> um, to answer your question though, yeah, really, on the, on the surface level, happiness typically is something that can come and go. But joy is something that it's like, you can be grieving and still be in joy. You can um, be facing a giant and still be in joy, where you not, might not be excited of like, I'm so glad that this obstacle has come my way, so you're not necessarily happy, but you're, you can still be full of joy. 
And so to me, joy is definitely something that is something that you just, it's, it's just alive in your spirit. It's, I'm in joy. You know, it's the same way that some people can be in a bad mood no matter what's going on. It's like, you just won the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, they're just in a bad mood no matter what. In a similar way, it's, um, I just got joy no matter what. And so it doesn't matter if I'm doing something that isn't my favorite or if I'm doing something that is my favorite. Um, I mean, joy and happiness at the same time is great, but really, um, again, you don't want your happiness just to be circumstances dependent on like, man, I feel great today, my family's happy today, I've got enough money in the bank today, so I'm happy. If any of those things aren't true, then I'm not happy, right? So, so it's not so much that. Um, again, to me, I don't really make a distinction because when you start, when you enjoy living in joy, you're kind of like, well, am I happy now or is it just joy? And it's like, I don't really care. It's, it's both. I don't know. Um, and uh, when things happen that you aren't crazy about, you're like, but I still feel happy, but I guess technically it's joy. So, um, so it's kind of different. It's like you said in your question, happiness, it, it, joy is more than an emotion. It's so much more than an emotion. It's just a deeper thing, just a reality. Um, one example that I like is, uh, is from C.S. Lewis in the Narnia books. And so for any of you who've watched Narnia, and he talks about how in one of the books, they go to Narnia and they, they get an apple and they go back to the real world or to our world. And they plant the apple seeds and it becomes, one of them becomes a tree. And it says this tree, when it, there was wind in Narnia, the tree would blow. And when there um, wasn't wind in Narnia, the tree would stay still no matter what was happening here, right? So if there was a storm here, the tree wouldn't blow if it was calm in Narnia. And if it was windy, you know, basically the Narnia was reflecting the reality it was from. And that's just a, a, a metaphor, an illustration really of we're in this world, but we're not of this world, right? So really we should be reacting to what's true in the spirit because that's where we're from, right? We're, we're not from this world. We're pilgrims in this world. We're ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So this is not our world. And so our emotions, how we feel, how we, um, how we see things, how we approach things should be reflecting where we're actually from not just uh, what's going on around us because we're not from here. We're, we're, we're aliens in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> take that quote out of context. <laughs> but we're, we're not from this world. I mean, we are pilgrims. We're from a different kingdom. Um, and so, uh, yeah, jo joy is really a reflection of that. Like, why would I, if you see, it, see what's true in the spirit, why would you not be full of joy? It's, it's absolutely amazing. That's so true. Focusing on who we are in Christ mm -hmm. instead of the, the carnal, yeah. natural. Yeah, and like we say, it's the Bible is a mirror of who we are in the yeah. spirit. So it's revealing to us what's really true yeah. so that we can receive it and walk in it by faith. And it doesn't have to just be like mental willpower faith. It can li literally be, you feel things bursting mm -hmm. in the spirit and other people don't understand why. Why are you so full of joy? And it's like, mm -hmm. it's who I am. I can't help it. It's, it's not based on you. Yes, so, mm -hmm. that's so good. Perfect, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, great questions. So Wakuna and Nikki on YouTube kind of have a similar question. Thank you so much. And you briefly touched on these, Daniel, during your message, but they asked if joy and peace are the highest determinants of God's calling, excuse me, <clears throat> what about responsibilities that one does not have joy and peace about carrying out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not sure if I fully understand what you're saying at the beginning, that they're the highest determinants of our, of our calling. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that go in. I mean, it's kind, of a, it's kind of an all or nothing thing, right? Am I walking in Christ? That comes with love, joy, and peace, but it also comes with wisdom and patience and self-control and, uh, you know, many other things. And so, uh, and some things are just like what God needs in that generation, right? It's like, I, this is your calling based on um, what's going on in the world right now and what I, I'm using you for. But... Uh, Sorry, could you repeat the second half of that? Yes, absolutely. So um, what about responsibilities that you right. may not have joy or peace to yeah. carry out? Okay, and, and, um, and I don't know if you saw my message a, a few weeks or a month or so ago about self-control and things like that, because people are asking about, um, you know, what about responsibilities other people put on you or duties, uh, things like that. And so to me, really, if you don't have peace about doing something, it could be, it could be a couple different things. And this is where you need wisdom and discernment because someone, someone might say, oh, I don't have joy about being married, so I should get out of this marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's, there's something else off there. So it means that you're not leaning into grace. You're not seeing them as a child of God, that God has called you to serve them and, and lay down your life for them. And, uh, and again, uh, so again, th there's a lot of, it's hard to answer questions that are very you know, specific. So I'll kind of answer in principles because I don't know your exact situation um, or if you have something in mind. But uh, but really, if there's things that people are putting on you, sometimes those can be a chokehold on your life where people are just kind of like, I demand you do this. And you're like, I just don't have peace about that. You know, and, uh, 
And so, yeah, if you don't have peace and you can't do it in joy, then sometimes, I mean, honestly, that's some, sometimes how that God gets your attention. For me, a lot of times the way I know my season's about to change is I just feel something stirring in me where I'm like, I used to love this. I used to love living in this house. Mm -hmm. I used to love doing this job. But suddenly now I feel like I'm losing the grace for it. Like things that I used to really enjoy, suddenly I'm not enjoying as much. And usually that's how I get, God gets my attention. And it's like, I think my season's about to change. And it may, maybe I'm going to go somewhere else and do something else, or maybe it just means I'm going to adjust how I think about things or how I approach things. And so, yeah, if you don't have joy or peace about something, then, uh, then again, I, I'd talk to God about it and say, what is this? One thing I like that uh, Billy Epperhart says regularly is um, sometimes people think that a lack of peace is God saying no, when in reality, it's actually our flesh that not having peace. And our flesh is saying, this is stretching me out of my comfort zone. Mm. I'm, I'm paraphrasing her. I'm not saying exactly how he says it. But a lot of times people mistake that and they say, I don't have peace about that, I shouldn't do it. And in reality, it's no, this is my flesh screaming that it doesn't wanna do this. And actually this is what God is calling me to do. Because again, stretching out of your comfort zone can be uncomfortable. And so we, we don't wanna mistake that and say, I'm uncomfortable, therefore I have no peace. Sometimes it's, I have peace to, to persevere past this. I need to stretch out of my comfort zone. I need to learn new things. Again, that's one thing that, that for me was a big chain, game changer in my life is I used to you know, think like, if this isn't easy for me, then I shouldn't do it. God's like, no, if it's not easy for you, sometimes I did call you to do that, but I called you to learn it. Mm. Be willing to do difficult things. If you, don't have, if you don't know how to do this, learn it. Mm. If I called, so don't just give up. Don't just say, you know, I peaked 20 years ago. If I didn't learn it back then, I refused to learn it. That's, no, I'll learn new things. I'll get better at things. I don't know how to do that. I'm not good at that, but I will be. And so sometimes we're uncomfortable because we don't know how to do something. And so again, it can mean a lot of different things. To me though, it's, it's a good rule of thumb to say, if I don't feel peace, I don't feel joy, I'm gonna go to God and ask God, why not? What is it about this? He may give you new direction or he may just say, you, you stopped doing this in my strength or you're, you're, you're doing this on your own and, yeah. and uh, come back to me. I have a better way of doing this. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, because there's so many different ways you might mean the question. I hope right. I hit on it <laughs> somewhere in there. Yeah. Well, I, I love that you touched on the stretched, being stretched and uncomfortable mm -hmm. because I think that um, when we follow God, He's going to call us to things mm -hmm. that are going to make us feel stretched and uncomfortable because yeah. He wants us to rely on Him. Yeah. So I am so glad that you asked that um, question and that you touched on that, Daniel. Yeah. And really that's the whole mm -hmm. point of growth, right? I mean, like my children, every day they're trying new things they've never tried before. Okay. They're learning new things. They're, they're you know, like right now they're into jigsaw puzzles. And so each time they master a jigsaw puzzle, I buy them one that's slightly harder. And then they master that one. And so sometimes it's a stretching thing of, of that's just how we grow, is being willing to step into things that we're not good at. If you only do things you're good at, it means you plateaued. You always wanna be learning to overcome new things and, and trusting God at a deeper level. I mean, there's things that I trust God with today where it's a piece of cake that 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to handle. Right. And the way you, you grow in that is by continually letting God stretch you and push you into circumstances that you're like, woof, I've never trusted God like this before, um, but I will. And so, um, yeah, yeah, it's life should never, never get comfortable in that sense. I mean, it, to me, it's always very comfortable. It's very easy, right? If you have enough strength, it's, it's a piece of cake in that sense, but it should never get boring where it's like, oh yeah, I've never, I, I don't grow anymore. I don't learn anymore. I'm never challenged anymore. You know, if you learn how to trust God with a hundred thousand dollars and then learn to trust God with 200,000, then 500, then a million. And you know, it should never just be kind of like, oh yeah, I've, I'm comfortable here. And that's what happens with a lot of people is they grow a certain amount and then they just stop. And so they're like, I've been a Christian 50 years. Yeah, but you stopped growing 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you're really a 20 year old Christian or some people even worse. Mm -hmm. I've been a Christian 30 years, but yeah, you've only li you've relived year one over and over and over. So, <laughs> so you're still in, on the first lap. You haven't actually run it yet. You know, you're still just kind of going in circles around the same mountain. So again, it's, it's great to be pushed and, and to be in a situation where you are challenged. I mean, it's great to, um, God's trying to call us up higher, like know me more, trust me more. I want to walk with you more. That's so, so good. Mm -hmm. It's all about relationship with him. Absolutely. Growing Amen. in intimacy with him. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Lara on chat asked, is joy a decision? Do I need to choose joy based on what God's word says about the circumstance I'm facing? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to have victory no matter what. Um, I'd say, I'd say yes 
and no, depending. <laughs> 7 a.m., guys, give me a break. <laughs> Stuart. And so I'd say, uh, again, maybe I'm an overthinker, but I'm trying to think all different ways someone might mean these questions. So I'd say yes in a sense of like, yes, I choose to stand in faith that, you know, I receive this. But at the same time, to me, it hasn't felt like a decision in a very long time. It's just something that, you know, you stay connected and it's just there. It's just something that you enjoy. But again, like I said, it's, it's something that at the beginning it is, you receive it by faith. It's like, I have joy. Um, but to me, I don't like to, I'm not a big fan of pretending. So to me, I'm not saying, um, how do I say this quickly? Um, I don't want to pretend that I have joy if I don't actually, if I'm not actually experiencing it. Because what happens sometimes, and this is why I'm balancing this out, is a lot of times Christians unintentionally retrain how they talk, but their experience doesn't actually change. And to me, I don't, I don't like that because I don't want to just change how I talk and just upgrade my Christianese lingo. I want it to, to be a reflection of the truth, right? I don't want to say like, oh yeah, I've got amazing joy, this is awesome, and in, in reality, I'm like, this is terrible, it's miserable, I'm not experiencing joy one bit, but I'll say the right thing. I know it's not what you're referring to, but I'm just throwing out that that um, extra factor is that, um, yes, in a sense, it's a decision to receive this and walk in this, but it is a real thing. It's not just a mental gymnastics thing that we do to, to convince ourselves. It's, no, I'm actually walking in joy. You know, again, to me, we receive things by faith, but then we, we should receive them, experience them. And if we're not experiencing them, we should go to God and say, why am I not experiencing this thing? Because if, if, we, if we go to God and we tell him everything that we should tell him, but none of it's true, we're only tricking ourselves. So to me, I'm a big fan of going to God and just being totally transparent and saying, I know that this is true, but why am I not experiencing it? You know, I know that I'm full of joy. I know I'm full of faith, but um, why do I not feel it right now? I know my feelings are wrong, but, but why are they wrong? And you know, what lie am I believing? What area am I not trusting you in? And is there something I'm holding on to that I need to let go of? Is there something I'm not holding on to that I need to hold on to? And so to me, I like to have very blunt conversations with God in light of everything. So, you know, I don't go to God and say, you're wrong, this isn't true. I go to God and say, I know I'm wrong, but I don't know why I'm wrong. Um, fix me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I'm not going to fix myself, but I'm just going to go to you. And honestly, you know, you don't need to know what the surgeon knows. So you don't need to know everything wrong with us to go to God. Sometimes we think in order to pray effectively, I need to know exactly what's wrong. So I need to spend all my time thinking about my own heart and my own experience right. so that I can ask God just perfectly exactly what to do. And that's like going for open heart surgery and saying, I need to tell the surgeon exactly what to do and I need to stay awake the whole time. And in reality, it's like, no, they know, God knows what you need. So the, the secret is to go to him and let him do the surgery. So again, I probably drifted very far from what the original question, but my point in all this is, yes, it's a decision, but it shouldn't just be something that we say and never experience. It's a real thing. Uh, to me, joy is something that um, maybe I'll, um, Maybe I'll do a sequel to this one and, and go more in depth on this because it really is a real thing where I used to, one of my first messages I ever shared like 14 years ago or something like that was called Avoid Sharp Objects. And I was talking about how when you're truly, you truly get a, re a revelation of God's goodness and, and joy and all these wonderful things, I was like, avoid sharp objects because if something pokes me, I feel like I'm going to pop. I mean, that's where that came from is one day I was just kind of like, I don't even know what to do. I feel like I'm about to explode because I just have never had this much joy in my life. It went from theory to my reality. Mm. And, uh, and again, that's how we want everything to be, right? I don't want to just know the theologically that I'm healed. I want to walk in perfect health. I don't want to just know that I've got joy. I want to experience joy. It's really fun to experience joy. And so... Uh, Short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Hey. Yes, <laughs> I warned you, it's early. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I think we have time for one more question, yeah. if you're willing. Uh, Lixon on YouTube would like to know, what are some practical tips mm -hmm. to walk in his grace and strength and not our own strength? Mm -hmm. Hmm, some practical tips. <laughs> well, without deviating too much, because this is a whole teaching, and that's what I was referring to when I said I might do a sequel to this, is worship. Worship's huge because, see, like I said, if you start focusing on yourself and saying, how do I fix me? How do I feel these things I want to feel? How do I walk in these things I want to walk? That's not being connected to the vine. Be being introspective is actually a huge problem and because we're looking to ourselves and not to Him. And so worship really is about pointing our hearts toward Him. And as we focus on Him and just enjoying Him and blessing Him, Again, it's, it's uh, as we focus on Him, we're giving Him access to our hearts. 
And so it's a very practical thing of like, I'm going to spend time praising you. I mean, Andrew has teachings on the power of praise. I think maybe a year or two ago I did one on worship. I can't remember if I did or not. Yeah. But uh, Effortless Change, Power of Praise by Andrew. There, there's teachings on this. But again, focusing on God, having a thankful heart, just focusing on Him and saying, you fix me. I'm not going to sit around thinking about what's wrong with me and how to fix me and what I need to ask for. I'm just going to focus on you. And as I focus on you, I'm giving you access to focus on me. And so again, you're, you're saying, here's my heart. You fix it. I'm just going to enjoy you. Sometimes people say, you know, if you ask God for humility, he's going to start embarrassing you all the time. And that's not how that works. That's not how God teaches us. He's, he's loving. He's a loving father. So it's actually, as you ask to know God more, what he, the way he changes you is by revealing his heart to you. And as he reveals his heart to you and you understand it more, you realize, oh, that's what's inside of me also. And it starts to transform you without you even trying. So to me, real transformation is something only God can do inside of us. And the way we do that, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, as we behold him, Again, that's why I was mentioning worship. As we behold him, he transforms us. So again, behold him is a secret. Him transforming is not something that you can micromanage. So you know, I know we're out of time, but it's been fun hanging out with you all this morning. Uh, it's been helpful. I guess I'll pass it back over to you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Bennett. That was such a blessing. And I look forward to meditating on these truths and applying them to my own life. And I'm sure you will too. Well, thanks again for joining us for Karis Daily Live Bible Study. We love you and appreciate you. Have a blessed day. Awesome. Thanks. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV. 